So again, if you think about it from a strategic communication standpoint, this is a phenomenal pivot. So you have international oil companies that are trying to become international energy companies. And they, from a branding standpoint, they need to have the facts on the ground that they're making the transition. It's not just public relations, but real actual transitions. Hello and welcome to Comms Life from Apco Worldwide. I'm your host, Tom Billinghurst. Every episode, we take a deep dive into the topics and trends shaping the communications industry and beyond. In this episode, we're joined by John Defterios, former anchor and editor at CNN's Emerging Markets. We're going to look at how broadcast platforms must keep pace with the ever-evolving social media and digital landscape to retain the attention of their viewers in an ever more competitive landscape. John, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Tom. Appreciate it. Great having you here. First of all, we should start with the news uh, that you are joining APCO. So first of all, welcome to APCO. Yeah, thanks very much. Secondly, can you tell us a bit more about what your role with us is going to entail? Well, I'm joining as a strategic advisor for 50% of my time, uh, based out of London, but with a brief to cover Europe uh, and the Middle East and when needed uh, to be global in nature. Uh, I have experience here stretching back uh, 25 years in the Middle East. So I would imagine it'll be about a week to 10 days a month within the region, which is a growth region for APCO, of course. Absolutely. Well, we look forward to having you around much more often. Um, what was it that swayed your decision to come from the media side of the fence to the communications side? Well, it's interesting. I've been on air for uh, 35 years, and I think it's always a good policy to leave at the peak of your game. So that, that's important. Uh, secondarily, I spent, uh, in particular, the last 15 years more as an analyst for CNN, kind of putting uh, everything into context or connecting the dots uh, within this region, uh, the relationship going to China and India and the Silk Road strategy. I spent about 30 or 40 percent of my time covering energy, and we can talk about this energy transition, Absolutely. which is very important. Uh, but I don't see a big differentiation between that strategic analysis and then moving into strategy full time. In, in fact, from an intellectual standpoint, I find it much more stimulating to say, how do you shape policy? How do you help the partners, whether in government or in the private sector, uh, the international governmental organizations, the intersection between those three pillars uh, on a strategic uh, level is fascinating to me. And then the connections again, uh, between East and West. If you think about the UAE and the broader Gulf states or the broader Middle East and North Africa, uh, strategically, geographically, they are at the crossroads of East and West. And I think in the next 25 years, strategically important in terms of their energy transition, but also the trade routes and what they have to offer and the positioning by the various states here. Uh, how do they position themselves for growth, foreign direct investment, uh, economic reforms, uh, dovetailing off of the Arab Spring, which I covered uh, post-2011, where do they go for the next uh, 20 years is strategically important for them. Absolutely. Just to, to pick up on that point that you make about uh, the UAE in particular becoming a global growth market, uh, you're delivering a, a talk at the New York University in Abu Dhabi at the start of next year on that topic. Can yeah. you give us a sneak peek or a preview of, of what it is you're going to say and how the UAE can become a global growth market. So the coursework at NYU Abu Dhabi, and they have campuses all over the world, so this is something that can be moved to, say, a Shanghai or a London or at the home campus uh, at New York University, of course, in Manhattan, uh, is to say who are going to be the major growth drivers in the future, right? So traditionally, if you think about the major financial centers of the world, it's Singapore, Hong Kong, London, New York, and it's almost a flyover over the Middle East and North Africa. So the UAE, Dubai in particular, is seen as a financial center for the region. But what would it take for it to become a global emerging market, a center of growth? And you think about it, geographically, it is at the crossroads and could be easily the center of growth if it thinks in that scale. So the conversation within the NYU apparatus is to say to the students, what are the key drivers for that next generation of growth? And if you see what they're doing at this stage, right now, uh, not only the airline connectivity that they have, the port facilities that they have. So I think it's a fascinating window in history, if you will, for the students to say, wow, we always looked at this as the Middle East and North Africa, a, a financial center like Dubai, but we never put it in the context of the next scale up. 
So from Asia to Europe and to the United States, what's missing in between is a global emerging market. That's the strategy. Absolutely. And, and moving to that, that next phase, communications will obviously play a, a vital role. Um, and as for the reasons that you've already highlighted about being on the strategic side and designing strategy, um, is there an avenue or something that's novel or niche that you want to achieve um, when you're coming over to the comms side of the fence? So what I think there's a, a nexus point between, say, what's on broadcast media today and what's on digital media and what uh, are the communica communications uh, companies of the future. Uh, and I think what you need to see is the gravitation towards uh, stickier content uh, digitally. So something that's editorial, that has its editorial independence, that but can be aligned with a private uh, company or a government that wants to be in partnership for that. And then you build content specifically for that government or specifically for those corporations that is not editorial. So you have this nexus between what is good editorial content that's informative, whether it's in emerging markets, whether it's about the energy transition, uh, what's the role of APCO in that set, and then how do you develop it to be, in a sense, a production arm of APCO as well, which I think is an exciting period of time because people are looking for quality content. Uh, most of the digital content you see, say on the corporate side, is very corporate in nature, so it could be stickier, it could be more informative, it could be more neutral actually, and just align a brand with that content digitally. Absolutely. That's where you're going in the future. But if, if I can take you back to your, your CNN uh, days covering the Middle East, you, you came to the region um, when the Arab Spring uprisings were you know, making news everywhere. Um, and you were in the thick of that. So, so for the region and for the developing economies that, that are part of um, the legacy of, of that seismic shift, what are the lessons that you would say um, the economies and the leaders need to learn to move forwards from here? Well, that was uh, uh, an insurmountable challenge, right? Because the, the dishes were broken in almost every kitchen, right? Uh, and the number one lesson is if you're gonna embark on this journey of economic development, the primary source of attention should be the people themselves in terms of employment, right? So any sort of foreign direct investment that you bring in has to drive growth from the bottom up. Uh, and so it's the conditions that uh, any government uh, sets in collaboration with uh, the private sector that says, okay, what are the conditions that you want to move into my country specifically uh, that'll attract the FDI and major projects, which naturally will create jobs, right? It's not the, the flashy projects, it's the projects that actually deliver uh, results. So that's the, the number one lesson of the Arab Spring. But, you know, to date myself, my first visit here was in 1990 when I covered the Gulf War, the invasion of uh, yeah. uh, Kuwait. And I remember staying at the creek in Dubai at the Sheraton and then I was invited to go look at the early stages, I mean very early stages of Jebel Ali and uh, right. His Excellency Sultan bin Sulaim who's the chairman of DP World. And said, we're gonna build this deep water port and I didn't even see the water top, <laughs> so there was no water there. And he said, well, you look a little bit skeptical. And I said, well, I, it, because I can't see the water from the position we're sitting now, I don't know where this deep water port goes. But it's that sort of vision is what we're talking about in terms of being daring yeah. to go and move and build something as large as Jebel Ali. I took Emirates Airline when they were leasing two planes from Pakistan Airlines. They didn't even own their own planes at the time. Uh, so it was very early stages, but it gives you an indication of what can be built. And I think what's all exciting to link it back to the Arab Spring, uh, if you look at the journey that Saudi Arabia is on right now, right, it's the largest economy in the region. Mm -hmm. You have a reformer in Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, he's eager to attract his uh, foreign direct investment. He's using Aramco and Sadek, the two pillars of their economy, uh, to do PPPs, to bring in private sector investors, yeah. both Saudi investors to have that capital come back into the country, but international investors as well. Uh, Bahrain is on the, the same journey, right? Then you see it almost copycat. You know, Kuwait wants to do the same. Egypt is a large market, but consumer-wise. Uh, President Zizi has driven growth, particularly coming out of the pandemic. What can he do to even accelerate that foreign direct investment? So the healthiest trend I've seen since being based here for the last uh, 10 years in the UAE is a healthy competition to say, okay, what models work, which sectors don't need to be duplicated. Where can we find our own space? Where do we diversify? Uh, with the, the prize being investment comes in and then you deal with that unemployment issue that was kind of the giant elephant in the room, particularly in a place 
uh, like Egypt. The trigger point would be in Tunisia. You know, if you go as far west as Morocco, uh, they had the same challenges. But if all of those countries are in the reform process, which is a healthy thing. The next stage of that, by the way, in terms of a wider strategy and the uh, supporting governments and private corporations, is how do they trade amongst themselves? The initial instinct was, okay, I'll always look west, you know, so I'm investing in Europe, I'm investing in the United States. There's been a distinct Silk Road strategy for the last decade. UAE led that, but they're not alone. So everybody's looking to China and India, the two largest emerging markets. So I have this interest as the former emerging markets editor of CNN. And then that Silk Road, you know, you go east and go south. Large markets like Indonesia, right? The, the, the relations with Singapore are solid. Malaysia is the same thing. So there's great potential. And the connectivity uh, that the UAE and other now because of the Gulf Airlines that have followed that path into Africa, it's a huge market, right? It's just a leap down south, uh, which makes a lot of sense. So connecting those dots and then say, can I put that into my growth strategy as a government? And what makes me unique in the FDI space? I mean, from a strategic communication standpoint, I think the most important thing is, you know, governments, along with the private sector, define what your unique selling proposition is. And if you can help them map that and say, okay, what is the messaging around it? But most importantly, what's the policy that supports my journey? I think that's strategically important. Absolutely. Something that uh, almost became a specialism for you is the energy sector. Mm. There is, once again, a vision behind that. We speak to people often who um, are based here in the Emirates, and the first question they get when they go to international conferences is, why are you diversifying your energy mix? It's never how. It's always this question of, you've got such rich oil reserves, why would you bother diversifying? And I think it comes back once again to this vision. Um, but on, on the energy sector itself, how important is this moment, this global energy transition and renewable solutions that are being developed and championed in some sense um, in the Middle East? Well, it's a great uh, question. And it's interesting because I, if anything, if you go back say five to seven years, I was hydrocarbon heavy, Absolutely. right? So because of the two thirds of the proven reserves are sitting in this region as you're suggesting, right? So uh, the International Renewable Energy Agency, the former director general, Adnan Amin, said to me, you know, there's a transition underway and you need to tune into it. So it's interesting at the heart of the proven reserves, arena sits in Abu Dhabi. And there was a reason that the UAE was very eager to get it because they knew where this is going. Mm -hmm. Now, nobody knew how fast that transition was going to take place. So five years ago, I had people saying, oh, you're overreacting to the transition. You've kind of gone in with both feet. You know, there's a long shelf life of 50 years for oil. But what has changed in that discussion now, and this was driven again by ARENA, they're saying that the daily demand, which peaked in the end of 2019 of 100 million barrels a day, that is the peak and it's not coming back. And they're saying if we, and this is that kind of uh, confluence of the factors that are at play here. If you really want to be serious mm. about capping global warming at 1.5 degrees centigrade, then demand for oil needs to go down 75% to 2050. So that is just radical language that only appeared kind of bold enough in this year after the pandemic. That was kind of just pie in the sky thinking five years ago because the cost of solar and wind was five, if you go back a decade, yeah. yeah, 10 times higher, right? Uh, but now it's on parity. So again, if you think about it from a strategic communication standpoint, this is a phenomenal pivot. So you have international oil companies that are trying to become international energy companies. And they, from a branding standpoint, they need to have the facts on the ground that they're making the transition. It's not just public relations but real actual transitions. But how do you articulate that to a very skeptical society? Because people are not believers uh, that this is the, the real deal. But that energy transition, that narrative for companies, the narrative for governments, and then the collaboration with institutions like ARENA and others, the United Nations. COP26, again, from a communication standpoint, for all companies that are in the energy value chain, they need to articulate it. This is a very important window. And then, as you know, the UAE is trying to get COP28 here uh, thereafter. Preempted my next question, which was, um, I kind of want to dovetail this a little bit with the fact that IRENA is, is based here. That's the International Renewable Energy Agency has been based in, in Abu Dhabi since 2009 when it won the bid. 
The fact that you have IRENA based here, um, the fact that they have that the UAE has formally submitted its bid for COP28, one thing or an aspect that obviously in, interests us is the communications side of that. And I wanted to ask you from someone who's been in broadcast for the best part of three decades more than, what have you seen that has been good communications in getting the message of the energy transition out there? And, and what has not been as effective from what you've received? Well, number one, I find it fascinating that the UAE wants to position itself as uh, the leader in terms of the region and that narrative to COP28, right? So that says something uh, that it wants to be ambitious and then hopefully serve as a leader for the oil and gas producers to say, how do we clean up the carbon cycle? Can we serve as an example uh, to do so? But there's a bigger strategic question that you're answering. And I have to suggest, even in the international channels, there's kind of a Western bias, if you will. So I was based in London, you know, four times in my career in New York as well. And there's always this, okay, is it coming from the West? So it's interesting who generates the studies and the information. But if it comes from, you know, the United States or if it comes from Europe, people have a tendency, oh, that's an interesting angle. I'll leap on it, right, as an angle and they say, okay, I know that institution and I trust that institution. Let's run with it. And then when IRENA came out in mid-March with the yeah. original pathway, it was such a bold statement. In fact, yeah. I chaired the roundtable and press conference with the Director General Francesco La Camera. But then afterwards, uh, I asked him about that. I said, well, that's bold. He says, you know what? At this stage of the energy cycle that we're in today and the real true threat of climate change, that's our role. <laughs> we, we have to lay out the pathway how to get to you know, capping uh, global warming at 1.5 degrees. There is no other pathway. And the worrying thing is that there's almost like, yes, that's the target for 1.5 degrees centigrade, right? And that's the target. But what does it actually mean if we don't hit it? It's not like you get to cross over 1.5 and you get to 2.5 and you get to dial it back. It doesn't work that way from all the experts I spoke to. And most worrying is you speak for the next generation, you know, I spoke to probably 100 policymakers and think tank leaders and the rest. And most people think we're not going to make it. And this is kind of the, the elephant in the room. It's yeah. like, can we actually make it or not? So it has to go beyond this idea of pledges. Can we accelerate the COP26 process? You know, if it comes into the UAE for COP28, you know, concrete, absolute emissions reductions. And I think the Biden administration, having jumped in in such a large way with these aspirations of nearly $2 trillion on the new infrastructure, which is green driven, uh, is incredibly important. And it brought the US and China, which are having tensions amongst themselves, but it brought them together on a one common goal, which is the environment. And they kept to bring you know, large states like India into the discussion and into the policy. Thanks for tuning into Comms Life by APCO Worldwide. If you're enjoying this, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us wherever you get your podcasts from. Catch up on all our previous episodes where we discuss everything from the future of aviation with Arabian Aerospace to the global economic recovery with The Economist. Welcome back to Comms Life from APCO Worldwide. We're still here with John Defterios, former Emerging Markets anchor and editor at CNN. John, in the second part of Comms Life, we usually look at uh, a relevant or recent news item to the topic we're discussing, but it would be a waste of this opportunity to not get your thoughts on, on the industry as a whole. Um, you've been involved in it um, recently, obviously, when this huge shift has occurred with the rise and proliferation of social media platforms and digital channels, um, and broadcast companies have had to cater to that to, to keep the eyeballs of their audience. Where do you see broadcast specifically, and then perhaps the wider media industry, where do you see it going in terms of being able to consistently deliver the quality of editorial that is required and needed in this age of misinformation and fake news? Well, I, I find uh, fascinating, uh, for example, you know, of, of the stories that I covered or the analysis I covered on a major story. For example, most recently, the Ever Given and the gigantic uh, cargo uh, carrier that got lodged into the uh, into the Suez Canal. Um, most of the feedback I got, I mean, like ninety five percent of the feedback came from the content that was on social media, and we were, you know, doing good, solid coverage, I think, and it was married very well with the digital coverage that was out there. 
But what I find, not just with the Suez Canal or any story, it's the afterlife of that story where it lives in social media. So whether it's LinkedIn or it's Twitter, or it's at YouTube, you know, the proliferation of the digital platforms is what's so fascinating. So it is trying to say, okay, there's the kind of official social media platforms, the major you know, digital platforms like a CNN. Yes, they get good traffic, but it's the afterlife. How do you understand that the data and how do you build that into strategies so it becomes much more pervasive uh, as a product? Because these things, if it's good, if it's good content, if it tells them something that they want to hear, I think that's a, circling back to the conversation we had a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm. A lot of people say, okay, I'm on the social media platforms as a company, for example, and they're putting out kind of corporate announcements, almost like video press releases, right? Does, yeah. Is that the most engaging way to reach you know, the decision makers of the world? You know, or do you just want to th be a thought leader in your sector is what, the way I would put it. So if I'm a company that's out there, do I want to be a thought leader in this space and not just look at my sliver of the business, but the totality of my sector, and I'm a thought leader in the sector. And I think that's the growth area when it comes to, to social media and strategy. Am I a thought leader that's kind of leading the dialogue in my sector? Absolutely. This is something that we've touched on in, in previous episodes um, with other people in the, the AI space, um, kind of influencers and, and new media uh, that's packaged specifically for social media. So I want to get your thoughts on it as well. And it's whether social media is an overwhelming force for good or force for bad. Because when you have the credibility of a CNN, when you know you have seasoned journalists who do the fact checking, mm. go to the places they need to go to to get their sources and, and package it properly, factually, then it's great. The proliferation of, of accounts that can create content mm. that, aren't, that don't have that rigor um, and that work experience and credibility to them that's when it becomes a bit of a gray area, I think. Sure. I find this really interesting, and I would draw the comparison between the 2008-9 financial crisis, and um, I have many friends of mine that are in the banking sector, and they would describe products to me, and I'd say, you know, they'd say a wrapper. I'm selling a bond with a wrapper. I said, what's that mean? Well, we have the A plus, you know, content on the, you know, the outside of it. It's wrapped and it is like almost the equivalent of a junk bond. And they wrap it up because it makes it look better, right? But it provides a high yield because inside that you know, sandwich, if you will, is you know, a, a more risky product, right? And the regulators didn't know how to regulate this. So the innovation of the products were well ahead of regulation. So what's the pace that a government can keep up with with that sort of level of disruption and in innovation? It's not dissimilar to what you see uh, in social media today because these are global companies and there is no global regulator. So it's fascinating, and there probably won't be because of the volume that we're talking about. Even in the case of Russia and the accusations that yeah. was coming from the United States, they're saying, oh, there's hacking going here, there's hacking going there, or there's fake news being driven. It's like, well, what was the evidence? And who's supposed to regulate that, right? So again, as a strategic communications person, you have to say uh, as an institution and for those in the industry watching is that what's, there's also another role here for the partners that you work with is to say like, let's make this as credible as possible. Let's have it as factual as possible, right? And then we have to be ready to combat those that are you know, ready for attack that are not using fact, it's just opinion, right? And that's, it is almost this, if I use the analogy, you know, from the early uh, 1900s, it's like the Wild West, right? It's, this is how it's being settled and disrupted and changing. And the narrative around Facebook was saying, like, well, we have you know, two and a half billion postings every day. There's no way we can keep up with it. Well, it is your business. So who's going to take that role in the future is a, a critical question, right? Because if that much volume and you're such a global player, is it possible? Well, probably the reality is not. So do you dial it back? Do you get regulation on a national basis? That, that's a question that hasn't been answered yet, but it's a fascinating one when it comes to fake news. It absolutely is. And, and there's one more uh, question on this topic that I, I want to put your way because I'd be fascinated to, to get your thoughts on it. And it's whether there is too much power now in the hands of the social media companies, the big ones that, that you've mentioned. We saw certain political leaders silenced, mm -hmm. whether rightly or wrongly, um, they effectively had their base taken from them. Um, and without an independent regulator to, to constantly fact check, as you mentioned, it is in the hands of, of these companies to determine whether or not someone can say 
what they want to say, whether it's, as you've said earlier, an opinion or whether it's research and evidence-based. Do they have too much power? Many are suggesting that, you know, we have almost oligarchies in the United States when it comes to social media. I mean, there's five players. Uh, again, this goes back to regulation. I'm not a kind of heavy-handed regulation person, so I'm giving that context. I'm not, you know, big one that says, okay, the government needs to intervene on every stage. But if you look at the acquisitions of the major companies that you're talking about in the United States, right, these five big ones, uh, you don't have that sort of concentration in Europe that you do, say, in China. But the acquisition sprees that they have, I mean, 40, 50, up to 100 country, uh, companies acquired in a short span of you know, a year to three years, depending on the company. That's extraordinary. And then as a result of it, it's not like it's killed off innovation because Silicon Valley, that's the art of Silicon Valley. They just keep on creating. But who ends up owning those companies? And then are they too big? to regulate is a, is a, a phenomenal question that there's not an answer for yet, but then there's going to be an accountability issue. Okay, you're that big and you've hired so many different or brought in so many different companies. Why can't you regulate, you know, what's going out there? Now, I think because of President Trump uh, and what he did with social media when it blurred into kind of fake, fake news, like posting things that you know, just didn't match up with reality, Somebody had to step in. If you don't have a global regulator and they thought it was kind of uh, broke their own rules internally. So there's rules of the game at a Twitter, for example, mm -hmm. or at a Facebook. And you say, okay, this is breaking all our standards, whether it's Tom or John or a president. You violated it. Three strikes are out. We're taking you down. I don't even find that so radical because these are the kind of names of the game. And you actually sign on when you get your account that these are the rules of the game. But is it enough at this stage? I would kind of argue not. So too much concentration of power for sure. Where were the, you know, the Federal Communications Commission? Is the FCC in the United States or Ofcom in the UK? I mean, do they have the bandwidth to deal with this pro proliferation of content? I would kind of argue not, right? Because it's just grown exponentially over the last, uh, what, 12 years. We hope you're enjoying this APCO Worldwide production. To find out more of what we do in the communication space, head to apcoworldwide.com and see how we are helping firms build back stronger. Welcome back to Comms Life from APCO Worldwide. We're still here with John Defterios, former anchor and editor at CNN's Emerging Markets. John, thanks so much for sticking around. Thanks. We dealt with some pretty um, heavy topics in, in the first uh, segment there. In the, in the second section now, we'd like to get to know you, the person, a little bit better. So we have a regular feature of getting to know you questions, if you're ready for me to fire these I your way. I think so. We'll see how it goes. Let's do this. Okay. <laughs> it's on tape. <laughs> okay. Your earliest childhood memory. Oh, that's, that's a good one because it led to what I wanted to do professionally. Uh, a child of the 60s, born in 1961. Uh, my first memories, phenomenally, was the, the funeral of Martin Luther King on television and it, how it racked you know, the United States and people were glued. And I had this moment, even as a six or seven year old child, uh, looking and saying, hey, look at the impact of that, you know, on, from that box, which was you know, moving into color television in the late 60s, right? But the way it kind of brought people together and having news, you know, kind of be the conversation piece. And I, I thought to myself, God, wouldn't it be a fascinating business to work in? But the first childhood impression was the 60s and the power of television. And it all stemmed from, from a, a huge moment that was captured yeah. on, on television for the first time. Um, your hero or idol when you were growing up? Mm. The first one that popped to mind is uh, Reggie Jackson. He used to play for the Oakland A's, was a home run hitter. And he was my idol. I still use it as a password once in a while because he was a phenomenal uh, athlete. We'll go and try that now. We'll yeah, right, exactly. Uh, number two, I mean, a uh, Walter Cronkite, for example, or some of the major correspondents we had in the United States, particularly those that were overseas, I was really fascinated how good they were as communicators. I was so entranced by some of the network correspondents. We have some of those uh, still that are at CNN that you, if you listen to their writing, it's almost like music. So this art of writing to video and the, the power of language and how you shape a story is still something that's very interesting. 
By the way, that, that's the nexus with communication because you're telling a story, right, for different brands uh, and different organizations, different governments. But uh, yes, that, that I, I, there's a number of different foreign correspondents when I was growing up. That was fascinating. You also mentioned uh, writing as an art form, and it can take various different art forms, which is a nice segue into this question, which is um, one work of art uh, that you would say that everyone has to experience at least once in their life, whether it's hmm. something they read, experience, see, what would it be? Uh, well, I've told you, my wife is uh, Italian and Greek, but grew up in Rome. I uh, had the great fortune uh, to live in Rome for four years. And uh, she always said, you know, we have to get you into the Sistine Chapel. And she was a correspondent for Vatican Radio. Uh, so we were able to go at a time when it was not very busy. It wasn't an exclusive tour or anything. But if you, if you haven't seen it, it blows your mind away. So, I mean, literally you look up at the the ceiling and saw what Michelangelo did and his kind of lunacy, kind of challenging different yeah. you know, popes yeah. and telling them, you know, get out of the room, I'm not done yet type yeah. of thing. And two thirds of the UNESCO heritage sits in Italy, which is a fact that most people don't know. So that experience can be duplicated in other, uh, other venues in Italy. But it's the piece of art that you sit in awe and say the perspective is so phenomenal. Like it, it's so genius that it brings tears to your eyes, right? So the people of Italy are also in themselves an art form. Yeah, which no, it's is, true. Which is nice. I'm sure yeah, that's going to secure you a lot of brown yeah, but it, yeah, it also No, but it also taught you a lesson how to dress. Yeah. <laughs> As an American roaming around Rome. Uh, my wife-to-be uh, certainly restructured my uh, wardrobe. <laughs> restructured is a very good way of putting it. Um, next one, John. Your perfect escape. Huh. That's, that, that's, well, easy and not easy. I'm from California, which is a beautiful state. Uh, fantastic nature. I'm still awed by its diversity, which is fantastic. It's magical. It's still a good place in my heart. I was married in Italy. My wife is uh, half Greek, half Italian. I think the Mediterranean light uh, against the white domes and the, and, the, and the sea is something you can't capture anywhere else in the world. So, you know, my heart's in the med when it comes to my great escapes. And I would put Italy and Greece kind of in a similar uh, category there. Absolutely. Um... If you could have lived the life of anyone else, dead or alive, who would it be? I don't know, Tom. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Usually I frame that answer, which I think is a, a fair point. I wish I had nine lives. You know, one, one life would be a cappuccino or making you know, uh, uh, ice frappes on a Greek island my entire life, which would be great. Like if you could put me into Crete, and, which has got good culture and a decent sized population. Yeah. and it's connected, and you say, can you work as a cappuccino guy? I would say, absolutely, exactly. yes. Um, so I, I would, and this is a really candid, on, honest answer. I feel blessed, actually. So to pick your career at seven, uh, to have done it for you know, 40 years, 35 years on air, and then to design your next chapter, which I'm doing you know, with APCO and, and other uh, teaching opportunities, speaking opportunities, I don't think I need to do it as someone else, right? I'm in awe of this. I talked about like a Michelangelo and the artist, which I don't have artistic talent. Uh, so the honest answer are these people that are that creative. I'm also extremely impressed with the leading chief executives or the, lead, the leaders of the world that can shape policy and you know, have the bigger vision in life. So the UAE, right? That came in 1990, there was nothing here. And to see what it is today is pretty extraordinary. There's a theme there, which is whether it's a cappuccino or a thriving economy is making something and creating something out of yeah, it. Yeah, that's so true, actually. That's, that's a nice And the perfect thread. cappuccino is, uh, yeah. it's it's not an easy art to form. Do. Yeah, yeah true. absolutely. Final question, um, and this is for you to fill in the sentence. I love communications and media because? Uh, I find it incredibly creative and exciting. I love engaging with audiences and doing live events because you're working with such a high caliber people on a panel. You think about it, they're the best of breed that are sitting in front of you and you get to brainstorm on you know, major trends or seismic shift or the pandemic, right? How to create a country that's growing and attracts investment. Incredibly, and you're learning all the time. Tom, I mean, you're getting paid to learn. Absolutely, fantastic yeah. stuff. John, that was an absolute pleasure. Great Thanks. conversation. Yeah, nice thank to meet you, you too. so much for joining us on Conversation. You guys have to, thank, uh, have to thank you for welcoming me into your office. I just kind of landed here a week ago. So. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> welcome to APCO. That's how we do it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, John. Thanks for listening to Comms Life. If you liked that, leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts. 
send us any questions or comments on our Twitter page. And while you're at it, you can subscribe to and download Comms Life on our YouTube channel or wherever you get your podcasts from. Stay safe and be well. Thank you.